pre-diabetes and 90% of them don't know it. To learn your risk, take the American Diabetes Association Type 2 Risk Test. State Circle is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Connecting Marylanders to their government. This is State Circle. Good evening. Welcome to State Circle. Coming up tonight, what voters need to know about Maryland's two ballot questions. And we'll see how one family is adapting to distance learning. But first tonight, two coronavirus signals, one from the White House, one from the State House. Maryland officials reported that on one day this week, there were zero deaths. That's the first time that has happened in six months. The total number of Marylanders hospitalized is 323, down from the peak in May of 1700. Still 34 people have lost their lives to the disease in the last week. From the White House, however, the news that President Trump and Melania Trump have both tested positive for the disease. Both are quarantining in the executive mansion. Our newsmaker this week is Andrew Pekosh, professor and vice chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Pekosh, we very much appreciate your time. Good to see you again. Let's start with your reaction to the idea that the coronavirus has now pretty clearly spread within the walls of the White House or Air Force One. You know, it, I'd like to say that this was unexpected, but you certainly have seen um, situations in, uh, in the White House where there have been lots of people walking around with no masks and not following some of the social distancing rules uh, that we know work with this virus. So um, it, it, it turns out that it's actually quite simple. Masks, such as the one that I'm wearing here, social distancing, uh, those are the things that will allow us to return to parts of our life, um, but it will also keep us safe from SARS-CoV-2 infection. You know, I've been wondering if I, I'm personally, not, not people in the White House, getting a little bit complacent. And, and I've been, you know, full germaphobe with this. I got hand sanitizer. I have three different kinds of masks. I have a pulse oximeter. Um, I overreacted, but you can't maybe sustain that level of, of high alert. And I'm thinking about the general public. Maybe this is a little reminder that, that gone into the fall, we, we still need to be on high alert. Absolutely. Um, fatigue from these kind of public health interventions is a natural progression. And a lot of the public health preparedness experts um, have written about this before. Uh, so the real thing now is, are there things that can help us sort of refocus? Um, some of these things can be little things. If you notice, my mask actually has little coronaviruses on them. So does, sometimes, does that help? Does that repel the other coronaviruses? Or uh, Well, you know, we, we're, we're experimenting with that now. Uh, but it allows you at least to incorporate that as something different in your life. Get a few that are different colors. Maybe try to match them with your outfits or, or have something on them that uh, is interesting uh, so that it motivates you to put them on, but it also then helps the people around you. If people see people with interesting masks on, maybe that gets them more interested in following this. Uh, fatigue from these kind of things is absolutely something that uh, is going to occur. The fall is going to bring us back inside as opposed to being outside during the summer months. And those are the situations that are going to really challenge us in terms of minimizing the spread of this virus. Not to knock the, the public health community here, but I wonder if masks were, were kind of sold the wrong way as this isn't going to help you, but this is going to help society at large. We talked earlier in the show about just a moment ago about how the, the numbers are getting better in terms of the number of inpatients in Maryland, the number of fatalities uh, from the disease. And it's hard to, hard to figure why that is because so many people are still testing positive. And I've read that one possibility is that even a mask like, like yours, not a surgical mask, not an N95 mask, may help somebody who is exposed inhale less of the virus and, and get a, a lower viral load uh, and possibly a, a less severe illness. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I've heard the same theory. I haven't seen any data to support that. 
Um, and certainly I'm not sure if uh, that's probably the best way for you to get exposures to a virus. I think a more likely scenario, and that's what's happening here in Maryland, is we're starting to see the COVID-19 cases shift to a younger age group. Uh, so we know that uh, when the first waves of viruses came through, the elderly were particularly targeted, and those were the groups that had the most severe disease. Now we're seeing a shift to younger groups. And in younger groups, we don't see the hospitalizations and the deaths as frequently as we did in the older age groups. So I think that's a more likely uh, explanation as to why we're seeing uh, a drop in the severe cases while we're still seeing upticks in numbers. And Maryland's a good state, but there are many states across the country, almost half the states that are actually in much worse case numbers than Maryland is right now. And again, it's that shift in demographics that may be driving the uh, less severe disease. There hasn't been anything new when it comes to, to therapeutics, uh, at least on the over-the-counter end or things people can do at home if they get sick to avoid going to the hospital. It's still kind of flu advice, stay hydrated, uh, maybe some Tylenol, right? Absolutely. You take care of your symptoms, particularly when they're mild and, or moderate. You can certainly call your healthcare provider. Better to call than to walk into your healthcare provider because, again, we want to minimize the chance of spread. Um, but pay attention to your body. If you start to feel shortness of breath, a little dizziness, um, more severe symptoms, that's when you immediately should act call your healthcare provider. Uh, most emergency rooms these days have special places that, that COVID-19 cases can enter in. And that's when you really want to try to seek out the more um, specialized medical care. I think the other thing to, to realize too is um, I think the medical community has gotten really good in terms of how they take care of both the moderate and the severe cases of COVID-19. Um, we have much lower chance of getting onto ventilators um, and that improves the outcome of infection. So the medical community has also learned how to take care of severe patients and the outcomes now are much more better uh, because of that experience that they've had and the learning process that they had from the first wave. What, what have we learned about the timeline from the, the point of exposure to the point where somebody becomes contagious to the point where uh, they may test positive and then be symptomatic? And I may not have all that in the right order, plus the idea that there's a turning point about a, about a week in. Yes, this is a fantastically important question. Um, Symptoms are, of course, the main thing that are confounding our ability to follow this virus because some studies estimate up to 40% of us may get infected and not show symptoms. But that doesn't mean that we can't spread the virus. And in fact, it may be that those people are spreading the virus more effectively because they're essentially not feeling any ill effects and aren't taking perhaps as stringent of public health intervention um, strategies as they could be. Um, we know that usually um, people can start spreading the virus within two days or so of their exposure. And then after that, it's anywhere from four to five days where they can actually be shedding infectious virus. So from the time of exposure to about seven days is the most dangerous time in terms of spreading the virus to others. Now, a lot of our tests can detect people and say that they're positive for longer periods than that. But that gets us into that area where you may be testing positive for uh, the RNA for the virus, but you're not able to spread the virus at that point in time. And there's a lot of research going on right now to get better testing in place to be able to differentiate the people who are infected and capable of spreading the virus from the people who are infected, but are probably no longer a threat to spread the virus to someone else. Can you, can you spread the virus before the point that you test positive? I heard somebody say earlier in the week that they didn't need masks at the White House because everybody who gets in there has had an antigen test. Uh, I think that the problem becomes the timing of everything. So between the time you're exposed and the time that you are uh, able to shed virus, you will have a window of time there where you'll be negative. Uh, because the virus hasn't had enough time to replicate in your nasal tract to a high enough level to be detected. So testing always has this window of time where if the virus, if you're exposed to the virus, 
If you're tested immediately, you'll be negative. If you're tested the next day, you may still be negative, but then sometime maybe in the next 24 hours while you're at work, you can start to shed virus. And that's the, that's the part with, with these testing that, uh, that uh, becomes a problem. And I'll also emphasize that we never wanna rely on one thing alone to protect us from infection. Testing is great. It is absolutely important, but testing combined with masks, combined with social distancing, gives you three separate layers of protection. And together, the, your protection is tremendously higher than if you just relied on any one of those. We were fortunate to get to speak to you a couple of times in the spring when this was just getting going. And this, this condition is right in your specialty, the, the spread of, of respiratory uh, viruses. Has anything surprised you over the last six months? Yeah, with the, the extent in which people who don't have symptoms are present in the population and can spread the virus. Uh, the first time I was on your show, I remember specifically saying, if you don't have symptoms, you shouldn't worry. That changed to, we, you may have very mild symptoms, and now it seems like a good number of people don't have any symptoms. And I think in terms of looking forward, we've also now seen that people who get infected have very different immune responses uh, to infection. So some people have very strong immune responses with lots of antibodies that will block the virus. Um, others tend to have rather weak responses to the infection and don't have very many antibodies that are detected within a few weeks after infection. So th that's important because as this virus continues to circulate through the population, it's eventually going to start finding these people who have had it before and these reinfections. Um, are going to be dictated by the amount of immunity that the person has gotten after their first infection. And so that's the real place right now that everybody's spending a lot of time on trying to understand what that means in terms of your ability to be protected from a second infection. Dr. Andy Pekosh at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, thanks so much for the time. We know you have to literally get right back to the lab. So uh, thanks again. Thanks for having me. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan reacted this week to the improving data by relaxing limits on nursing home visits and also allowing child care facilities to operate at full capacity. All 24 jurisdictions in the state of Maryland have positivity rates below 5 percent. 21 of them are under 4 percent. 14 jurisdictions are under 3 percent, including Baltimore City. Uh, four of them are under 2%, and we even have two jurisdictions that are now uh, having positivity rates less than 1%. Most schools remain closed, most students learning by computer. Our Nancy Yamada shows us how one family is dealing with the challenges. It's hard not seeing my friends, and it's harder to ask questions on the computer. The 10-year-old Violet Shellhorse, a fifth grader at Kemptown Elementary School, has adjusted to distance learning. On this day that we visited, she was in PE class outside with her laptop, following her teacher's instructions in her backyard. Sometimes like our computer like doesn't work right away and we have to like shut it down again, then bring it back up again. It's been a challenge to say to say the least. Besides internet connectivity issues. We live in a smaller house, so just it's always like musical chairs when we're on the, on the computer at the same time. Mother of two, Kelly Shellhorse, is a single mom and also works full time as a middle school counselor in Montgomery County. Schedule wise is um, very difficult. The girls, even within being in the same school, have different schedules. Different start times in the morning, different lunch times, different breaks throughout the day. And then with my job, it's just hard because my day is different. Her sanity saver is her planner and writing out each kid's schedule so they have a guide to follow every day. For her youngest child, seven-year-old Annabelle. What I like about it is that we get little breaks in between. That helps? Yeah. It's 1140 and mom is prepping for lunch, but both girls have different lunch schedules, so it's always a juggling act and they always have one eye on the clock. It's totally hectic because they're on classes and if I'm on a meeting and say that there is a technology issue, one gets bumped out of their Google Meet or the internet cuts out for a minute, um, which tends to happen sometimes, it's difficult because I could be in the middle of a lesson with 
you know, 30 students and I, I can't can't really help help them too much. When Shell Horse or her children get stressed or overwhelmed, they often take breaks outside. For this mom, it's all mind over matter. We are trying to be as positive as we can. Um, I try to tell the girls, you know, we're just, this is what it is right now, but hopefully, you know, soon we will all be back in school. And right now we just gotta take one day at a time and get through it. <laughs> I'm Nancy Yamada for State Circle. Joining us for the political roundtable this week are reporters Pamela Wood of the Baltimore Sun and Brian Sears of the Daily Record. Thanks to both of you for uh, being with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, we want to do a couple of things here. One is help voters understand the ballot questions that they're going to see when they vote. But, but first, we want to talk about the, uh, the news from the State Board of Revenue Estimates which is the agency in charge of guessing what the tax revenues over the next year or so are going to be. And they came out with new projections this week. Uh, what's the news? Yeah, I think the takeaway here is that things are not great, but it's not a catastrophe at this point with the state budget. Obviously, with businesses closed, uh, with people out of work, spending has been down, and the state's general fund gets most of its money from income tax and sales tax. So they're down a little bit, but much improved from the last time predictions were done uh, back in May, which really predicted a doomsday scenario of uh, billions and billions lost. So uh, the budget is that we're looking at is going to be down a little bit, um, but, but not quite, you know, cut it all the way to the bone level. Um, and the forecasters uh, cautioned that this Things could get worse, though, if the virus gets worse and if Congress doesn't come through with another stimulus package. And I should say at our taping time, there is not yet another stimulus package, but that would potentially be billions of dollars and, and a really big deal. And Jeff, to, to pick up where Pam left off, part of part of what the scenario they outlined this week was, was they acknowledge is a very best case scenario. They are not assuming in their in their projections currently a second wave or another spike um, locally or nationally. And they're also assuming that there will be some kind of a second round of stimulus. What we have, have really benefited from is this tremendous amount of stimulus, both in terms of the unemployment, extra unemployment benefits and the PPP and some of the other things that have kept businesses kind of afloat. And that has kept um, some of the, uh, the, the, re the revenues from income tax collections and other things um, artificially up. If those things don't come through, if there's a second wave, it gets bad. And we're still looking at almost a billion dollars in shortfall for this, you know, for this year and another shortfall for the coming year. Um, the, the governor and the Board of Public Works have taken some actions to kind of offset that. Um, but, you know, even if you're looking at six or seven hundred million dollars in the current fiscal year that they're going to need to deal with, it, it's still real money at the end. And, and they're going to have to probably make some tough decisions, assuming, again, that we don't see something that happens that makes this all worse. State and local governments, you know, get hit twice. I mean, the, their expenses go up as they try to help people. Uh, but at the same time, the, the income tax, the sales tax numbers can go down. The counties are a little bit insulated because they get a greater percentage of revenue from the property tax. But the state has already taken action, right? I mean, the Board of Public Works did some preliminary budget cuts. About yeah, 400 earlier, million. Yeah, about 400 million. And for this fiscal year that we're in right now, I expect that we will see further budget cuts uh, as well. But this perhaps avoids the idea of like mass layoffs of state workers or something catastrophic like that. But we will see continued belt tightening. And then the next year's budget is going to be lean. And Jeff, as you noted, uh, county governments, uh, Baltimore City government, they also are going to have to make tough decisions. They are, as you said, funded uh, in part by property taxes, which are pretty steady. Um, and the income tax, as Brian mentioned, uh, has been somewhat stable because of all of this federal aid. Um, but it is uh, not out of the woods yet for either local or state government. And, and well, as we've seen in the as we've seen during the Great Recession, Jeff, the local governments. Um, the state, the state, when it has crafted its budgets, has gone and taken money from the local government or shifted costs that the state would normally pick up back to local 
local governments. So I think that, you know, local governments are also sort of casting a wary eye on Annapolis's budget and kind of wondering how this will affect them, uh, it, you know, when we get back to Annapolis in January. Both of the ballot questions that, that voters are going to have to decide on involve money. Uh, one uh, having to do with the way the, the budget works, the way the budget is put together is a little bit more complicated. Let's start with a simple one, uh, which is sort of a, a, a vague uh, question about authorizing sports betting. Uh, how would it work? Yeah, that's the question. Uh, it's a very open-ended question. You know, details TBD. Uh, it's a broad-based question that specifically does not prescribe how many sports betting licenses there will be, who gets them. Is it racetracks? Is it casinos, pro sports franchises? Uh, all of those details are stripped out. So basically, voters are asked to approve the concept of sports betting, details to be determined later in future legislation. We talked to the, the lottery director recently who, who uh, pointed out that the money to be potentially gained for the state treasury there is real money, but you shouldn't think of it in, in terms of like the impact of, of casinos or the lottery. Correct. We know, um, we know from looking at uh, Las Vegas, for example, which has been doing sports betting for a long time, that sports betting really amounts to about 2% of their total handle um, you know, in billions of dollars of handle. I mean, so really we are looking at, uh, as you said, not, you know, it, it is not an insignificant amount of money. I mean, if somebody dropped, you know, dropped this, you know, dropped 10, 20, a hundred million dollars in your lap, you'd think that that was, uh, you know, that was a lot of money. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, in terms of paying for um, the expenses related to Kerwin, or even just holding it up against a, a 19 or a $20 billion general fund budget, it's a drop in the bucket. Now, and the, it's also this, money that's not going to come anytime soon. We will not on January 1st be able to start, you know, betting on sports. They have to write legislation. There's going to be a whole licensing process. It's probably going to be a couple of years before betting even starts if this is approved by voters. And meanwhile, you can still go to Pennsylvania. West Virginia runs ads here all the time during football season and, and March Madness about how you can drive over the over the border and bet there. Um, Maryland is woefully behind uh, the, the legislators really just uh, they, they dropped the proverbial ball on this uh, two years ago when they had a chance to get this rolling. All right. So so that's up to voters to decide if they want sports betting. The, the other question has to do with the uh, relative powers of the governor and the legislature in putting together the, the state budget, uh, it's kind of inside politics stuff, what, what would it change? Yeah, so question one on the ballot is, is a very Annapolis inside question that's now being put to all of the Maryland voters. Long story short, Maryland's governor has extraordinarily strong powers over the state budget, uh, the strongest of all the governors in the nation. When state lawmakers get his budget, they can uh, cut money, uh, but it's uh, pretty much impossible for them to move it around or add money to the state budget. This question would give them that authority. But with a, a trade-off, right? Yes, the governor would get a line item veto on any change, any addition that uh, legislators make. If they cut from column A and add to column B, that change, the governor could uh, veto that change specifically. There, there's a history to this, though, Jeff, because it used to be, you know, back in uh, you know, the early 1900s, Maryland had a system similar to what this question would do. And that was taken away and, and, and given, you know, the governor's position became strengthened because of profligate spending by the General Assembly. They were, they were writing things into the budget without concern about how it was going to be paid for. And this has come about now because the General Assembly has become increasingly frustrated by a Republican governor who will not come to heel on some of their budget priorities and they've attempted to fence things off and force him to force him to uh, to spend money on things that he doesn't want to spend money on and he refuses and they can't make him do it and so now they want a greater say in uh, in some of these budget priorities is this one partisan well oh, it's interesting yeah it, I, it I, is I, good not good no, it, it, is, it is partisan right now, but it has an interesting history that over the years, this has bounced around Annapolis for like 20 years, 
And sometimes it's been promoted by Republicans and sometimes Democrats. Um, you know, former state senator PJ Hogan uh, promoted this when he was both a Republican and when he was a Democrat. Um, it's kind of like situational, uh, more between the legislature and the governor of who has power. Of course, which parties hold those seats has changed over the years. And uh, before we go, Pam, uh, following your Twitter feed, I saw that you have voted. Uh, I'm still waiting for the, the ballot to arrive. How, how did you turn in your ballot? So I requested my ballot a long time ago online. Uh, I didn't wait for the mailing to come. So as soon as they were mailed out, I got one pretty quickly at my house. I filled it out. I took it to one of those Dropbox locations um, and popped it in the first, the first day they had it in uh, Anne Arundel County where I live, nice and easy. And Brian, you're, you're an equally public-minded uh, citizen, right? I am. I haven't missed an election since I was eligible to vote in uh, 1986, and and I went very early when they when they opened up getting ballots online. Uh, applied for my ballot, got it the within days of them mailing out the first ballots, and returned it very quickly. You can read uh, Brian Sears' reports at thedailyrecord.com and Pam Wood, of course, at baltimoresun.com. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Thank, Thank you. you. And that is State Circle for this week. Remember, you can see videos of our local programs online at video.mpt.tv. And please follow us on Twitter and Facebook at MPT News. Now for all of us at MPT, I'm Jeff Salkin. Thanks for watching and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities. Programs on MPT are made possible by our members and the following. Listen up, Maryland. The 2020 election is coming up. Make your vote count. Eligible voters can stay safe and vote by mail. It's easy, but you must be registered to vote and make sure your ballot request is received before October 20th. When you receive your ballot, fill